this guide setting up your Mac for web development in 2021. We're going to skip a lot of the obvious stuff, but get you started as soon as possible up and running with web development. In particular, this video we're going to set up at the end, Ruby on Rails, but if you want to set up other frameworks, the rest of the guide will be perfectly fine for you as well, including if you want to do a Laravel for PHP, Django for um, Python, and other languages, uh, basically all the JavaScript frameworks for web development, but we'll, we'll get onto those and uh, do those in other videos. To get started, however, this this uh, this rest of the guide is going to be applicable for pretty much every web development thing that you want to do. So to get started, uh, I don't need to tell you the obvious stuff. Get yourself Chrome, and if nothing else other than a trivial reason, that when I actually press maximize Apple, um, I actually want it to maximize on the screen. Thank you. And and Safari just doesn't. <laughs> Chrome does, but no, the the. Legitimately, there's an actual good reason for having Chrome. It's pretty much the standard as far as web development is concerned for looking at the developer tools online. Uh, you can use Firefox, of course. You, you probably want to have all the browsers available, but I'm not going to go into those in particular detail. Instead, what I'm going to go into is the stuff, first of all, step one, the stuff that drives me crazy with any new Mac. Now, I'm using here a 2012 era Retina MacBook Pro to show that you can use a much older Mac. You don't have to buy a new one to actually get started. But I do also have an M1 Mac next to me, and I may well use the M1 Mac for, for future videos, uh, just because, if nothing else, all the fans don't kick on. And that's, that's one thing with using older, um, uh, older Macs that uh, you may well hear fan noise. You shouldn't hear them on the video, but I can hear in the room. So um, with that gets with that started, um, if you did want to buy a new one, by the way, don't feel free to don't don't um, don't feel the need to buy the most expensive Mac there is. There's no need for it. The modern M1 Macs are all amazingly fast. So buy um, something reasonable for your particular budget if you wanted something new. Uh, the Mac Mini is fine. The uh, MacBook Air is fine. Um, they're both very, very good. But if only the, the upgrade that I would suggest that you may want to do because it's not something that you can upgrade later is upgrading the RAM from 8 gigabytes to 16 gigabytes in case you want to do extra stuff like Xcode and iOS development in the future. And we may go into other videos about that then. But let's get started with changing all the system stuff that drives me crazy. First, <laughs> and this is nothing to do with installing programs. This is just to get me some decent uh, defaults. So let's just go into system preferences. And first of all, general, I'm just going to go across and hide and show the menu bar. Because when I'm doing a web development, I don't want to get distracted with other stuff coming in, apart from the stuff I want. And that also means I can right click down here and click on turn hiding on. Now, I'm in Catalina on this Mac, but the M1 Max will have... Uh, more up-to-date version of macOS. It doesn't matter for web development. Pretty much, you you're okay to use whichever is is fine for you. You know, uh, the latest version is is obviously preferable. So now we have a blank image on the screen, and uh, we need to get going. So to get started, one of the first things you're going to want to do is customize a little bit the Finder. I uh, have some issues with the Finder, and also uh, I'm using a mouse, so I would very much suggest, if you're used to using a mouse, going as a mouse down here and turning off scroll direction natural. I like using natural scroll direction on trackpads, but on mice I want the upwards scrolling of the scroll wheel to actually move upwards on the page not downwards and that's that drives me crazy in new Macs. also in finder by default this thing is awful there is there's not much here that i actually uh, well not much that i actually use here on the left hand side and instead i actually do want to use stuff um and have them available so a few things are just worthwhile changing go into finder go into preferences and then down here, you can see a list of other things you want, might want to add. So for example, my name's Tom, so I want to add my home folder. I might want to add movies. That's where my, this video has been recorded to. And maybe pictures and stuff like that on there as well. Uh, other stuff you can add here. Uh, so I can turn that off and you can see them. You can also do that by just going into any of the folders. And by the way, the, the keyboard combination to move upwards through folders in the Mac is not obvious either. It is basically command and up. So that uh, will let you go up one level. There's back and forward, so it, that doesn't make much difference. However, you can then add more folders to the left-hand side here just by dragging them across. So if I wanted, let's say, my pictures folder, oh, the picture's already there. Let's just say music folder. I can just drag them across and put them in the list available, and uh, Tom should be at the top up there. Good. So that's uh, an easy thing to do. The other thing is to make, press Command forward slash to say to show this bar at the bottom. It shows then all the amount of space you've got available on your Mac. You can also get to that by going to view and then uh, show uh, show and hide status bar. Here it is. So you can just do that, turn it back off again, turn it back on, 
and that's good. So you've got everything here. If you want a quick reference for things, so for example, if I want to get to applications quickly, you can also drag them down here onto this uh, sort of right hand side of the bar, and then you can just click and see all your applications that are installed. I have nothing installed here other than what comes with Catalina. And of course, there may be slight differences when you go to different uh, newer versions of macOS, but um, this is what we've got so far. So in utilities, one of the first things you're going to be using is a terminal. And here's the built-in one, which works perfectly fine. However, it's sort of limited. Um, you can add extra tabs by pressing Command T, but I think pretty much every web developer is going to just use a, a different something else other than that. So to get started, we're going to go install a few programs. Step one, we're going to go for item two. Oh, did that maximize? It's horrible in Safari. Um, item two, pretty much the standard terminal emulator for uh, Mac OS. So go ahead and download that. Uh, yes, I want to allow downloads. I should probably switch to Chrome at some point, but that's perfectly fine. So we're just going to go ahead and install it and have that available. Did I not have my downloads available here? That's the other thing that I often want. So let's just have a new thing just to show me my downloads down here as well. I can just then grab things and open them. And we'll install that. Uh, that's Chrome. I didn't want to. No, it's just actually created the application. So I can just drag that across to applications. And there we go. So item two is now installed. And if we just do command space, I can type item and get that to run. Yes, let's open it. Analyze notifications, that's gonna be quite useful. And the pip3 command requires command line developer tools. Yes, you're gonna to want to install these. So that's automatic. You don't have to do anything else. But what this is is basically installing um, command line tools like um, compiling applications and uh, Git for version control and stuff like that. So it'll download, then it'll install, and we'll carry on with the video. With that installed, we're now gonna just change a few things, mainly so that you can see this on the screen a lot easier. I'm gonna maximize this, uh, this up, Alt, click on the maximize button to maximize it without going full screen. I don't really like the full screen options, but this is obviously far too small for you guys to read. So I'm just gonna go into item two, then to preferences, go across to profiles, then text, and down here, you should be able to choose the text size. I'm gonna choose 18. So that is hopefully a lot easier for you to actually see. So there it goes. And we are on, uh, I'm gonna change my system name in a little bit, but uh, we're on my MacBook Pro, as you can see. And if I tap LS, I can see everything there that I have. Uh, oh, we need to <laughs> we need to go across and install some other things. So uh, first of all, I'm gonna go then and just quit that. We've done that. And then we're gonna install oh my ZSH. Oh my ZSH is um, basically ZSH is the shell environment that you got in iTerm. So this thing basically here that I type into that I can do things like, for example, uh, type git status uh, is, yeah, uh, do we have git? Yeah, we do have git available. Uh, and then I can scroll up through things. I can do tab completion, like um, git, uh, can I do tab completion git status? I don't think I can, but I'll show you some of it all later. And also the things up here that shows you what we're actually doing. Uh, what what directory we're in and other stuff like that will appear. However, uh, the default one is not exactly how I particularly like it, so I'm just going to install uh, oh my ZSH, which is going to be quite easy to do. We can just copy and paste this line down here and do that, and then we should be able to copy and paste it in here, and I don't have to do anything else. So you can see that is started, and now you can see the 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 prompt has changed and also some defaults have changed. So folders then show up as, is L installed? Yes, it is, good. So you can see that folders are showing up as blue and then I've got uh, sort of white for files and stuff like that. And I can see hidden file files and stuff like that as well anywhere. Uh, so everything's good there. The other thing I was gonna just mention in Finder is in Finder preferences. So uh, there is, you have options in here for different things. Uh, mainly that you can also then choose uh, to show all file name extensions. You may well want that depending on uh, depending on what you uh, what you want personally. Anyway, let's get that out of the way, and then um, carrying on with terminal. So from terminal here, we've got oh my zsh installed. Um, that's uh, that out of the way. The next thing I'm going to want in my case, well let's just move those along. I, I don't want those just yet. Is homebrew. 
Homebrew is uh, essentially a uh, an easy way to install lots of things that need compilation or grab. It's basically a package manager, as it says, the missing package manager. Mac OS, if you're not familiar with a package manager, if you're from the Windows world, uh, basically it makes your life a lot, lot easier as far as that's concerned. You can just click it here and then press this, paste and press enter. This is probably going to take a little while. Now uh, let's see if it's actually going to start. It's going to ask me for my password. Yes, let's go. And uh, off it goes. And there it goes. So I'm going to go pause the recording now until it's finished. But once it's finished, we'll then be able to use homebrew or the brew command to install other stuff really, really easily. With Homebrew now installed, we're going to move on and look at text editors. Text editors you're going to use pretty much all day, every day as part of any web developer's life. And there are three main good options that I know of or that I use on Mac OS. One is Video Visual Studio Code. This is quite a modern uh, application and uh, I would be quite happy with doing that uh, or using it on any Mac. And we can just grab that and say allow. The other two are older but both very good. TextMate is available essentially free, uh, which is worthwhile grabbing. Yep, and we'll grab that as well. And also Sublime, you can get a free trial, but it is actually a paid software. Um, it is Nagware, so it will not ever shut you down, but every few file opens, it will say, hey, you really should buy a license. The, the, the only downside to that is the license for this thing is around about £100, I think. Yeah, it's $99, so about £70 or whatever the exchange rate is these days. Um, yeah, lost track, really, the whole pand pandemic. But we've got uh, those three options. All three are good. In this particular um, set of this set of videos, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code. It has a few nice features, including things like showing when files are um are in git version control and whether they've been updated and stuff like that so yeah worthwhile having if you don't know what git version control is don't worry we'll show it in future videos but it is just uh useful to have so get whichever text editor you prefer i'm going to grab all three so they're real on my system and there's lots of really really good stuff with these text editors including snippets uh letting you massively increase the amount of code you can write with very short amounts of uh of keyboard uh, keyboard input. Uh, there is a few more text editors I should mention that I'm not going to cover, and that's things like Emacs and V and Vim and various GVim and all, all kinds of other stuff like that that are perhaps out of the context of like a nude web developer. Um, they are very much expert systems, uh, able to be get even more productive than these text editors, but it takes a lot of doing to actually do that. So I'm going to leave those out of this particular install and we can always come back to them later. Now, uh, we should get Homebrew to install for us a database. Now, in any um, framework, in, for example, Ruby on Rails is one of them, or Laravel, um, you're going to want a database. Now, by default, Ruby on Rails ships with um, just installing SQLite. SQLite is a file-based database, so you don't have to install anything, but that's not what you're going to do when you're going to put it onto a server out for the world. So I pref much prefer having that database installed on my local machine so it's as, as close as it can possibly be to wherever we install our applications, places like Heroku, AWS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to do that, that's really easy. I'm going to use Postgres by here, but you can also use MySQL. Uh, they're both different types of database, so I'm just going to type in brew install PostgreSQL. And now... <laughs> Now this may take a little while while it goes and grabs Postgres and installs it for you. And that's now installed. So you just want to make sure that it is actually running. So to start that, we're just going to basically type this line right here, brew services start PostgreSQL, and that's going to just start it in the background so that it's available for you. Okay, uh, that's going to basically do some stuff and should be ready. While that's going on, uh, we're going to just want to go across to uh, and in install a client for it. So this is just a program you can use on your desktop that will see your Postgres database or other databases. You can have different ones. This, is, this one's appropriate for Postgres and just download uh, the latest version, in this case of PG Admin. There are others, the ones you can pay money for. PG Admin happens to be free. So it's kind of nice that I'm just basically choosing lots of free tools that you don't have to do anything. So there we go. That's the, that uh, particular file and we're just going to then install that once it downloads are you finished with installing yes it started in the background and uh, we can see it's homebrew based postgresql 
And then we'll just do the same thing with this as we normally do and just drag applications across. Um, that's that's Chrome. Do I keep selecting Chrome? I don't want to select Chrome. <laughs> Give me the application uh, in my downloads, please. Yes, PG Admin, please, not Chrome. There we go. Just press agree and go through that process, usual kind of stuff. And we've got that available. So that can kind of carry on in the background. Now, uh, what we should probably discuss a little bit is uh, programming languages. Now, your Mac will come with different programming languages by default. Let me just start a new tab up by pressing Command T here. And sorry about that dialogue. That's just going to work in the background. Um, if we look at, let's say, just the version of Ruby that's installed by default, 2.6.3. That's 2019 stuff. We probably want a better version than that. And we want to have control over the versions. Let's just take, uh, let's just see what versions of PHP. Remember, I'm on Catalina here, the latest version of Catalina, I believe. So um, different versions of PHP will be available. So that's 2020 branch of PHP. And how about Python? Uh, with Python, you'll have uh, yeah, 2.7. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, can I just quit to get that? Oh, quit. Open brackets, close brackets. Um, yes, so uh, Python is 2.7. You may want 2.7 or 3, depending on which version of Python you're using in, in web development. So uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to install other versions than that. Anyway, to carry on, there we go. We just drag our PG admin across, and that should be pretty much done shortly. Uh, it's, it's 400 megabytes. Okay, it is a web-based app application. That's quite a lot, but uh, it, yeah, I'm just... I'm just complaining for complaining sake there. Right, so onward then with installing uh, RVM. So for Ruby, we want to have in different projects, we might want to use different versions of Ruby. So if I'm working on a legacy project, I might have to use an old version of Ruby. If I'm creating a new application, I want pretty much almost the most up-to-date version as possible. So to install it, we're just going to grab here from this uh, rvm.io. Uh, you can see, yes, we can do various things, but I'm just going to install, um, well, you can install Ruby on Rails in one command, but I'm not going to do it in one command. I'm going to keep things separate. So in here, I'm going to paste in this, and it's going to install Ruby version manager. There it is. And it's installing. Shouldn't take very long in that case, I don't think. And uh, are you finished with uh, everything else. I can shut that tab and we're back down to the Ruby tab. There we go. This is now ready. So if I type in RVM list, uh, oh, I need to just open a new tab and close this one or go into a source command, but I'll just open a tab and close this one. It's easy. RVM. Yep. So that's installed. I can do stuff. So RVM list and it's probably going to go, uh, no. <laughs> so what we now need to do is install a version of Ruby that RVM will then use to, you know, that we can then program with. So uh, to do that, we're going to look on to ruby-lang.org and take a look at uh, the latest version of Ruby. So let's just take a look at uh, different versions of Ruby that are available. Ruby 3.0.2 is released. Um, this release includes security fixes. Uh, so I will start out with, that was in July. So that, that should be enough time for various different um, authors to update their code. So having that available is fine. So we don't need to worry about downloading it all and stuff like that because we have Ruby version manager to install it for us. The older version of Ruby is 2.7.4 if you didn't want the 3.0 branch, but don't worry, we're just going to go 3.0. So to install that, we're just going to use RVM install ruby dash 3.0.2 now if no one's actually created a, 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 a compiled version of this yet your your mac is now going to compile it um that may take a little bit of time and your mac will heat up while doing it don't worry it's quite normal so let's see if we have one available searching for binary rubies i think people have already compiled no it looks like we're going to go through compilation so i'm going to stop the video here and we'll come back once it's finished compiling Ruby is now complete, so installed. So we should just be able to do RVM list again. And now we should see, yes, this is installed. And you can see also with these characters, it's saying that that's the current and it also happens to be the default. So uh, that will be the default for new projects. Uh, before we carry on, just now that we've installed all of our text editors, we do want to do one more thing with text editors. I've switched over to Chrome here because like, you can see the full URL here in case you need to look at this yourself. Uh, in uh, each of them, there is a command line version of the program to launch that editor. So for example, I'm here in my home folder. If I want to create, let's say, a, a new folder, so I'm going to go make directory 
uh, sites, let's say, and then uh, ls, uh, sorry, go into, let's change the directory into sites. These are common Linux commands. You'll get used to them quite easily. Nothing in there at the moment. Uh, if I wanted to create something in here, I create a project. And uh, to do that, I'm going to want to then open that project. So I'm just going to make a directory, uh, whoops, make a directory um, test, for example. Uh, I'm going to go into that. And then I'm going to just create a test file, text text.txt. Uh, that just creates an empty file. Now, if I look here, I've got a, an empty file. But this file is going to have, the, this. these folders are typically going to have hundreds or thousands of files in them. So I'm going to want to be able to open my text editor of choice to any particular folder and have it as a project because there isn't any project files like in something like Visual Studio or um, Xcode. So we're going to want to be able to type a command to be able to just say, hey, open here in a text editor. So to start that out, it's quite easy. It's different for each text editor, but there is one for each of these three. So uh, for Mac, it says here for uh, command line, uh, sorry, the command line interface for sublime text. If you're using ZSH, the default, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're just going to copy and paste this for ZSH into here. And that's pretty much going to enter my Z profile file. Don't worry about what that is just yet. Uh, the same thing for TextMate. So we're going to want to do that. Uh, I need to just double check this. I'll come back to that. I'm not going to be using TextMate for the moment. but uh, And then in uh, Visual Studio Code, we're going to do, um, well, you have to actually do it from within Visual Studio Code, and it's quite straightforward to do. It says instructions here is open the command palette, command shift P and type shell command. So um, let's just wait for that to boot. And then um, I'm going to do a shell command. Install code command in path is what we want. Click on that, successfully installed. So now if I just go back here for a second and I'm just gonna do that trick of opening a new tab and then closing the old one because I'm not gonna use the source command. Uh, it's just easier to do it this way. And then I'm just gonna type in, let's say, see, uh, go into sites. Going to test. Uh, in fact, let's just see whether it will actually tab complete. It will, which is kind of handy. And then you can see those same files are here. And if I then type code here, um, you'll see it boots up Visual Studio Code. And then, yes, uh, it basically says trust. Yeah, trust everything. Uh, I'm, I know what I'm doing. Yes, I trust the authors. And then you see here left on this Explorer section. Let's just maximize this up. There is that that test file that I actually created here. And um, yeah, that's perfectly fine. I can do the same thing then with uh, Sublime. Um, so the same thing there, SUBL, and uh, the same thing is true. So very handy shortcut way of getting into that. You can go into each of the programs and then like go into file and open a workspace or um, open as project or whatever the individuals do, but it's much, much faster just to get around using the command line once you've learned a few things on, on the Mac. So that's fine. And I will do the text bit one after I've checked it through and uh, and that should be fine. But it, this is the URL for it. It's a very old uh, editor text mate, so I'm not too concerned about it for now. All right, so uh, we've got everything set up here. Now we have Ruby or the latest version of Ruby. We should, yep, 3.0.2. I'm just going to exit out of that. And now I'm going to basically want to set up Rails on top of Ruby. So uh, now we just need to uh, basically usually type uh, sudo uh, gem install Rails. And it's probably going to ask me for password. Yes. And now it's going to go and grab a whole bunch of different files. Uh, it shouldn't take as long as, as compilation, but yeah, there it goes. Gems are just prepackaged lots of files basically for all with Ruby code in them. So don't worry about what they are again yet if you're new to Ruby on Rails, but if you know what you're doing Ruby on Rails, you know exactly what gems are. So we will cover those independently and we gotta wait till that's finished installing. It shouldn't take very long. Um, building native extensions, that might take a little bit longer, but uh, yeah, no problem. We'll come back once it's done. Once that's finished doing everything, open up a new tab just as before and then type rails-v and you'll get rails 6.1.4 and you're ready to go. So if you create a directory or go into the ones I created here, uh, we can type in just Rails new and then a site name. So let's just say, um, well, I've already got a folder called test, so let's just call it test2. And you also can apply some optional stuff here uh, if you like. Now, by default, as I said before, it's going to install a SQL Lite, but if you want to use your database you just installed, you can just type dash dash database equals 
PostgreSQL, and it will have defaults for the database that you've installed on your system. And then just press enter, and away it'll go, and it'll create stuff, it'll install stuff, and uh, you should be ready to st get started uh, with um, with Ruby on Rails. Uh, however, there are some other things that you're going to want to install, um, and just let's do that in a next, another tab while the original one's actually installing. Uh, so now we're probably going to want a few other things. Uh, for example, I'm going to want probably npm and node, uh, the JavaScript stuff. But um, again, just brew install npm should do that job in particular. And uh, we should be good to go there. Let's go back to the original tab. Yeah, some of these are going to take a little while to install uh, the first time. But when you create another project after this point, it's going to be very fast indeed because you've already got them. So we'll have those available. Uh, on this side, this is also going to take a little bit of time while it downloads and potentially compiles stuff depending on what you're actually doing. So yes, I've got NPM. I will also um, have a couple of other things. I'm also going to install Redis. Uh, again, both of these are pretty optional. Um, I think NPM we're going to use anyway. Redis is optional, definitely, uh, but is very useful for doing all kinds of things in programming. In particular, it's useful for caching. It's useful for having queues. It's uh, well, we'll get into it, but to install it, brew install Redis and away you go. That's pretty much the entire thing, I think. I think we're ready pretty much to start web development and we can install more stuff as we go on later. And we can install that stuff via brew, ideally, because it's just easy. You just type brew install and whatever it is, brew will go and get it for you. We've got a web development framework to use. Again, we can go through in other videos and show you how to install things like Django, things like Laravel. There are different uh, other utilities, things like Docker, if you wanted to have container stuff. We'll go on to that again in another video. Hopefully this has helped you get through setting up a new Mac to a point at which you can start a new Ruby on Rails project. With the Rails, install the first program, the first um, basically a project we're going to go for. It's in Yarn, isn't it installed? So we're just going to want to go over here and actually install Yarn. Yarn is basically going to deal with some other stuff for us, so we may as well get it installed. And uh, installation, yes, yes, yes. We're going to install by npm. Yeah, we can do it that way. And of course, we're installing npm in the other tab, which is now done. So if I just open that and then do npm install Yarn. Uh, yeah, not yawn. And there it goes. I did one package, so we should be good to go. And if I just open another tab again, and I just go into my test two site. Okay, so there you can see um, we have our usual Rails sort of setup. We've got all our, of our usual files. Now, what I'm going to do, I just want to create a quick thing in this test project just so that I can show you the database browsing of PG Admin. So I'm just going to create, oh, I don't know, something that's that's pretty useless for this. So uh, Rails generates a, a scaffold. Uh, let's just call it um, items and give it a title and a description. OK, uh, don't worry what this command is. I'm just going to give it basically a, a command to generate a whole bunch of sample code that uh, includes a database migration. So I can just show you the database. And then I'm going to type Rails DB create. Uh, that will create a test2 database, or should do. Yep, there it has. And Rails DB migrate will actually just make the changes I've just asked for to the database. And we'll go into that. So now I should be able to just go to PG Admin, which we downloaded, if you remember. And if I go into that once it boots up, it should boot up in a browser sort of environment. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's fine. It used to be a standalone program, but they moved it to like HTML based, and uh, it's a bit inflated, but it it's generally not hard to use. Okay, PG Admin is now started up. Uh, can I do, do I just say no? It can't be empty. Okay, so I'll just, let's just do an example password. Doesn't much matter as far as this is concerned. So we can just maximize this as before. Alt click on the green button, and then we have servers on the left hand side. So if I look at this, it's going to have pretty much no servers by default. Uh, we're just going to create a server, and it's going to be a, basically a local host server. So I'm just going to type local host. It's on my machine. Uh, yes, 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 and it's going to say either hostname, address, or service must be provided. So, hostname is just going to be localhost. Okay, and leave the default port, uh, maintenance database, uh, username. That may well be your actual um, account name, like mine might be Tom instead of Postgres, but I'm just going to give it a try. Uh, Postgres does not exist. Yeah, maintenance database, fine. 
And I'm just going to change that to Tom in case that is actually the default. Yes, it is the default. OK, so that's fine. And then you can see here localhost. So I can see databases. And if I expand that out, you can see I've got the Postgres one you can ignore. And then these two databases that we just created. So if I go into those, I can then go and see if we just go down to schemas. And then into, well, oops, that's already, <laughs> that's already expanded. And then into tables we can see we've got a table called items. OK, so if I click on that and right click and then um, I want to just view the data. All rows, there aren't any rows, but this will also show a couple of other things. Yeah, so you'll see here at the bottom, these are the columns that have been created by that Rails command. So we've got ID, we've got title, we've got description. And these two are sort of provided by Rails, created out and updated out for when you create the records inside this table. So we have the PG admin working. It's all fine and connecting to Postgres. So I can close that for now. I don't normally, uh, yes, leave. It's, it's HTML based, so it shows that browser message. I don't normally use PG admin unless I actually need to. Um, I will generally just do things in command line, but it's there and it's very useful to have if you just want to browse the data and make sure that the commands you've typed are what you expect. So we've now got pretty much everything we need, and I'm just going to get rid of uh, those. Uh, test two. Uh, and uh, yep, yeah, so I'm also going to get rid of uh, test. Oops, not CD. No. Just want to RM, RF, test. All right, we've got a nice clean size directory ready to get started in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to subscribe down below. There are plenty of people who might be interested in future videos, and there are going to be a whole series of ones taking you through from scratch, getting into a full Rails project or a full site project for you to develop alongside. Uh, if you like the video, of course, click on the like button. You can press the bell for notifications if you've subscribed. And more importantly, leave comments then below with alternatives. A lot of these things I'm doing, are obviously, it's opinionated. It is my opinion as far as which of these programs are useful. I'm hoping that the majority of people who do web development on Mac will agree with me somewhat here. But of course, it is my opinion. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Other than that, we're ready to get on with the next video, and I hope I'll see you there.